How soon can you land? I can't tell. You can tell me I'm a doctor. No, I mean, I'm just not sure. Or can't you take a guess? Well, not for another two hours. You can't take a guess for another two hours? Hello, and welcome to episode 75 of Dots, Lines, and Destinations. It's Thursday, February 12th, 2015, and today I'm joined by Seth Miller, uh, live from Istanbul, Constantinople. It's Constantinople, thank you very much. I'm also going to guess that it's probably February 19th. Am I that off? Oh, I am. You might, you might be a week off. I'm a Although, I mean, I'm, your wife's going to love the fact she gets another Valentine's Day out of this, right? <laughs> I'm stuck in the past, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even going to touch that one. Uh, <laughs> It's the, hip, it's the hipster in me, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Portland, always a little slower than the rest of the world. <laughs> You'd be surprised. Um, how you doing? <laughs> well, a little punchy from jet lag, but other than that, uh, you know, getting by. Yeah. Uh, had had an interesting day, to say the least. But yeah, uh, yeah I saw I saw your I saw your tweets about uh, losing a valuable piece of equipment that every one of us needs. Hey, you know, getting off the plane in Paris and not having my wallet with me was an interesting experience. <laughs> oh, uh, man, oh, man. You know, it's interesting. I was actually – so flew uh, JFK Paris last night and then connected onward to Istanbul and had booked it as a 90-minute connection, 95 minutes, which my previous experiences in Paris have suggested that that was a guaranteed ain't no way in hell experience. <laughs> um, this time around, actually, it, it turned out that I had plenty of time. Um Air France to Air France, they've done things a little better now, apparently. In the last decade, they finally cleaned up a little bit of the mess. So, you know, everything was within the sort of 2E, 2F complex of gates and whatnot. And even with parking down way at one, all the way at the end of one of the term- terminals, I was probably maybe 20 minutes up and through, including uh-huh. reclearing security. Um, yeah. I, part of that was I had uh, sky priority. So I got the, uh, you know, the priority uh, n- number one priority lane or whatever. So it was a very short security line. Uh, but even that was probably only five or ten minutes of it. So the good news is um, I probably could have spent a little bit more time on the plane looking for my wallet. The bad news is I was pretty sure I had to make a choice between having a wallet with me and missing my connection. Oh. And I actually chose to make the connection. Which was, I mean, you wanted to get there, right, tonight to today. Um, so Right. Well, and I mean, there's a later flight. I could have I'd be just landing in an hour or so from now, like at midnight night, which would have been awful, but um, it would have been fine. I mean, whatever. It would have been fine. I would have gotten it. Anything would have been okay. But in my case, basically what happened is I knew I had my wallet with me sort of getting on the plane, or I was pretty sure anyways. Um, and as I was getting off the plane, sort of that, you know, slept for three hours last night, kind of confused, trying to get all my shit together and, you know, put everything in the right pocket and get off the plane and get going for my connection, which was now, we were delayed, so that was also part of my concern. So my connection was down to under an hour. Um, I was you know, sort of patting myself down. And as I was walking off the plane and halfway up the aisle, realized I didn't have my wallet with me mm-hmm. and sort of stepped out of the aisle into, you know, an exit door area and started going through all my stuff, trying to figure out where could it possibly be. Searched through my jacket pockets where I'm pretty sure I put it when I went through security last night. Um, wasn't there. And I was almost certain that's where it should have been, but it wasn't there. I actually went, I swam upstream on people trying to get off the plane, which is, you know, always a challenge uh, and actually searched my seat area again and didn't see it there. And at that point, it was legitimately like, maybe I left it at security in JFK. I don't know. Like, what do I do? But mm-hmm. um, for me, the answer was make the connection. And part of that comes from I have uh, a backup plan. Now, this is something I did a long, long time ago and have never, ever had to use. Um, I think the back, I used it once in Tunisia also. Um, and that is I keep a credit card and an ATM card for a second bank account separate from my wallet. They I, I have a, you know, a separate little binder clip full of all my travel program cards mm-hmm. and loyalty cards and stuck in with, you know, my honors and whatever SPG card uh, is also a random credit card and ATM card. And because they're separate from everything, you know, if I'm out walking around and get mugged, I'm still can, you know, finish my trip. Um, in this case, if I lose my wallet, I can still finish my trip. So I had an ATM card. I had a credit card. Obviously, you know, I had redundancy before and now i'm running on you know a single system so i put a try not to screw up uh, <laughs> while i'm in istanbul and the irony there is that istanbul is one of the cities where i've had more than my fair share of scam experiences so i'm going to pay a little more attention this trip than not but uh yeah i made the decision that i've got enough of my stuff uh that i can get by on this trip the other thing that's useful to me is i don't keep cash in my wallet it's just my cards yep so i legitimately like what was i out uh 20 bucks to the dmv to get a replacement driver's license and making a bunch of phone calls to get credit cards replaced. Yep. So when I look at it from that perspective, making my connection and getting on to Istanbul and, you know, getting things back on track was more important than panicking over where my credit cards might be. No, it does have have a happy ending, though. It does have a happy ending. (laughs) 
<laughs> I got an email after I landed in Hong Kong from Air France saying, hey, we found your stuff. Why are you a moron leaving it on our airplanes? Um, and landing in Hong Kong, and, you are delirious. Oh, shoot. Yeah, I'm not, no, I was talking. I, <laughs> turns out there's another flyer talker here, a uh, good friend from New York who we just happened to have dinner in uh, Istanbul. So go figure. <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> anyway, we were talking about his trip to Hong Kong recently. Uh, but no, when I landed in uh, Istanbul, I got an email from Air France saying that they had my stuff uh, and that I could either stop back by Paris and pick it up or they could arrange to ship it to me. So oh, nice. I've sent the email asking them what it'll be to ship it to me. I legitimately have to decide, like, how much is it going to cost in shipping versus what it would be just to you know, get a new driver's license and a couple other things. I'm worried that it's going to actually be, like, math. I have to decide one's better than the other versus just paying whatever they ask for. Yeah. Well, and the, you know, I've um, never, I've never... I also really don't want to learn new credit card numbers. <laughs> now, that's funny. <laughs> well, I, I have my credit... The credit cards I use, I have the numbers memorized, so... I can just type them in on you know web forms and whatnot, and if I have to learn new ones, that usually takes me a few months, and it's annoying. <laughs> I've never so. actually, you know, the the keeping of an extra card is actually a great idea. I, I don't do that, but I probably will start after talking to you because I keep an extra copy of my passport, like a printed uh, yeah. color copy of my passport in in my backpack, and then I leave. I usually leave the passport in the hotel, locked up in the safe. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I've never done that with cards, so I, I think it's a good idea actually, uh, especially the ATM yeah, card. No. It just, you know, what it comes down to is, like, this trip, I would have been fine. A, my friend who was here that I just had dinner with would have been able to spot me some cash. Like, I'm at a conference here where I know a whole bunch of people, uh, and the room was prepaid on point. So, like, and I and I actually had 70 Turkish lira from previous trips in my pocket when I landed. So, I could have gotten to the hotel and settled in and figured things out. Uh, I have an American Express card, and they'll almost always print you a new one anywhere in the world or get you a new one tomorrow if they can't print it locally. Wow. Um, I consider calling them just to see if they have a station in uh, Istanbul to get one, just, you know, for fun. But <laughs> um, I need something to do tomorrow morning. Uh, instead, I'll probably just hop on the ferry and go to Asia. But, um, you know, th- like, there's always ways to solve these problems and, you know, get back on track. It's a matter of how inconvenient and how much did you actually sort of leave behind somewhere. And in this case, part of it is I was you know, lucky, um, but part of it having a car, just something, something elsewhere that can get you sort of back on track and bridge you to whenever your next place that you can settle down and check in and sort of figure out what's up uh, makes a difference. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, let's just keep on the topic of, of your travels and just some stuff. And you and I had a discussion via email about uh, SLR lenses uh, for our cameras. And, yeah. you know, we were talking about renting lenses. That's something I do a lot. I know you, you rent lenses every now and then. And uh, just kind of what you do when you when you travel about what do you carry, what do you like to carry, and, and what do you rent? Like, what do you see as, like, something that's worth going out of your way to rent? Uh, the first time I did it was I rented a ginormous Zoom for uh, Africa Safari. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was a few years back. Uh, this time around, it was actually not entirely travel-related. I mean, I did have to drive up to Connecticut, but it was uh, an athletic competition and it was indoors so i knew the lighting was going to be awful and i wanted to be able to get good pictures of the athletes competing um yep. weightlifting event and so uh i rented uh actually for that one i actually rented a body also i rented a canon 5d mark ii oh nice i think or 50 50d mark ii is, are they both uh the, the one the, that's not full frame oh so it's the 50d yeah okay so the 50d mark ii um which is still a spectacular camera yeah uh, highly recommend it if you have the means uh and i got a a couple zoom lenses. I got a super wide, a 16 to 35 millimeter uh, f2.8 lens, and I got the 200 to 400. Mm-hmm. Is that possible? No. Uh, maybe the 100, 100, 100, 100 to 250 or 275 or something like that? 100 to 200 or 100 to 275, something like that. Yeah. Um, uh, while we're talking here, I'll see if I can pull up the receipt and find it. Uh, it was it was a good spread. It didn't have um, everything, but it had most of it. Yep. And uh, what was interesting... Uh, biggest mistake I made was dropping one of them and damaging it. Um, yeah, I hadn't told you that part yet. Surprise! <laughs> uh, I dropped the big lens, like, before anybody had even started competing early on in the uh, events. Uh, I, um, it was, like, had it around my neck and was this net. I put it down on the chair next to me and it fell off, and it, uh, it was a 70 to 200 is the lens I rented. Right, yeah. Um, yeah, it was, and I, it just landed right on the corner of the front uh, ring where you attach filters and whatnot, and it dinged it. Um, and they said, you know, if it was just the scratch on the outside, they wouldn't have cared, but it dinged it enough that you can't put filters on it. So they got to send it in for repair. So I'm actually still waiting for an invoice of what it's going to cost to repair that. Oh man, that sucks. Yeah. You know, I'm guessing it's not going to be the full $2,000 replacement value of the lens. So I think I'll get out of this one. Okay. But, um, 
Were you able to use this it? One? Were you able to use Oh yeah, it? I could I used it the whole time. Okay. Um, it didn't dam- it didn't damage any of the optics, it didn't damage anything substantial, but obviously if the next guy wants to put a filter on it, then he need to be able to do that. So there's gonna have to replace that piece. Yeah. Uh it was I love having the, the lens in the camera. Um it was that that was just a spectacular combination. I got some great shots that I would never have been able to do with mine. Um, low light stuff, action shots makes a huge difference. Uh, I, I struggle with it for just my general travels Mm -hmm. every now and then. I think I'd want something a little wider or a little different, but I typically travel with a, I think a 28 to 200 sort of all purpose mid range lens on my camera body. Yep. And I've been doing that for a while. And at one point I had wider lenses and other options, but it became way too heavy a kit for me. Yeah. Yeah. That's, 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 that's the, the balancing act. Yeah, that's the struggle. I mean, that's and that's kind of where I'm going. I'm I've been considering actually getting rid of my 60 and going f- uh, mirrorless um, for a few reasons. Mostly because I yeah. just want something lightweight. Um, right. And and I'm I'm kind of getting to the point where it's like, how much do I really need to zoom in? I love plane spotting, and that's one of the things. That's like the biggest hang up of the the whole thing is that right. there's, there's you need a big lens for plane spotting. Right. Um. So. Yeah, weight is the killer. I mean, or I just trespass and get closer to the planes. Yeah, there's that too. <laughs> weight is the big killer though, because I, like when I carry my 6D with just the the standard lens, um, which I think is a, I can't remember what it is. I want to say it's a 35 to one something. Um, it's it's a heavy lens, and so I can't use a lot of my backpacks that I have. Um, because the lens is so big, I have to pack the, them separately, um, and yeah. so I just don't like that. I mean. It's it's nice to have that great of a, it's a great camera it's a fantastic camera um, but it is it is a heavy beast um, yeah so yeah, I mean the the seventy to two hundred L glass I mean this is the you know the fancy gray Canon lens it's over three pounds alone yeah so and it doesn't sound like I mean, a lot like, but yeah you're but when you're limited around, to fifteen pa- and you're limited to fifteen pounds in your carry on if they bother to weigh you yeah exactly like in Europe um or fifteen to eighteen pounds like between that a two pound laptop. A couple pieces of cables, the bag itself, like you're, you're you quickly start running out of space. Yep, yep, and it becomes um, hard when you get to your destination. If you're trying, I, I know you're like a lightweight packer and things like that. If you're trying to like just go and you want to take some stuff out to lighten your load, mm-hmm. w- when you're already at, you know, with a camera body, when you're already at about five to six pounds, it's hard. To, it's hard to do that. I mean, it's to the point where I just kind of leave my bag and just take my camera because I just don't feel like dealing with it. <laughs> and, and that camera's yeah. heavy, so um, yeah, it's it's. Uh, I, I like to actually rent. This sounds funny, but I like to rent um, really nice prime lenses. <laughs> Is that wrong? Interesting. No, I'm like a, like a 50 millimeter one two or something. Yeah, like, like that. a 50 millimeter one two or like some, there's some there's a 28 millimeter uh, that I really like. That's really fast. I think it's a one four. I think. Um, and then there's one that's a it's a it's barely it's almost wide angle. Um, it doesn't do fisheye, but it's it's close. Uh, and I can't remember what it was. I think it might be a 17. Or 16, and it's like f one one four one eight or something, and it's, it shoots beautiful photos. But it's how usable is that? Because how often are you going to use something that wide? Right? It, it's rare. There is a reason yeah. for it, but I, I, churches maybe inside churches, mosques, synagogues, that kind of thing. I maybe I don't know. So um, I'd like to hear what the what the listeners do. I mean, because packing packing is one of those things. We've talked about me and my obsession with packing too many pants, but. <laughs> Uh, I'm interested to know how people pack their their technology and and like I've I just down like downsized my power cables and stuff. I'm going with one power cable that has three outlets and uh, one travel adapter. Um, I actually bought like three of them and I'm gonna try to review them like kind of like which one I like. Yeah. Um, cause I like that stuff weighs. I mean it takes up I mean it takes up space and it's I what's the easiest way to make that stuff work? I I know people who just pack way too much stuff and I, and I wonder how they do it. So. Yeah, no, I I've gotten much better about not packing extra clothes usually, but I still have way too much camera gear. Um, way too way too much. <laughs> yeah, but but you don't. I mean, you don't carry. I've seen how much you carry. And I don't even travel that. I don't even carry that much. But I still feel like not just camera gear, but like all my electronics and everything. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like it's a whole lot of stuff now. Yeah, I have. If you count my laptop, which has which is a tablet, so it has both forward and rear facing cameras. I'm looking around the room here. I have one, two, three. Three, four, five, six, seven camera devices around with you. me on this trip. Yeah, yeah, because you carry an SLR, a pocket point and shoot, a, a GoPro, a phone that has front and rear, and a laptop that has front and rear. What do you What do you use your uh, pocket point and shoot for? Uh, very little lately. Yeah. Oh, it's, <laughs> um, it's, 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 it's every it. now and then I come up with a use for it. It's, it's one of those. It's 
sometimes it makes sense and I like having it with me. It's relatively small, it's light and I keep it with me. But, um, well, and that's kind of been my push towards the mirrorless. It's so lightweight. It's kind of like throw it in your bag and go. Um, yeah, the, the trouble I've had with when I've looked at those as options has usually been, it's just not quite small enough for what I would hope it would be. Yeah. And then the lenses, like to get a decent lens on it, it ends up being a weird balance. Yep. I feel like, like to hold, to hand hold it with a, anything resembling a long lens on it, I feel like wouldn't be as stable as an SLR. Yep. I mean, I'm sure I'd learn eventually how to like do it and prop it and whatever, but I wonder about that. No, it's much, it's much heavier in the lens than it is in the body. And the bodies are very, very, very light. And so it does, like, I agree with you. It's weird. When I first held one, uh, I was went to a camera shop here. I first held one. I was like, this is kind of strange because the lens that he handed me was, was heavier than the, the, the entire camera body. And right. so you, you felt like it was lopsided when you were holding it. And so any action you did, you, it, you, you overacted almost. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, I th- I'm sure you get used to it, but it is a weird sensation. So, um, I think Foz is on now that I think he forgot about the show. Should we add him? <laughs> Sure. Should see we, if we can find him. Let's see if we can add him to the call. I'm just going to add him in and say hello, Foz. <laughs> see if he if he picks up. Hello there. Hey, Foz. We we're already recording, so we're just going to like do the next topic. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Sorry about that. No, that's okay. Uh, Welcome to the party. How you doing? <laughs> doing great. How's this stumble? Uh it's nice. It's actually a little cool, um, but I'm enjoying it so far. Probably warmer than here. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Um, so let's talk about the Southwest Airlines devaluation. Seth, you, you kind of took the lead on writing about this, and I think it was good of you to do that. Um, they, they've kind of gone to a dynamic pricing model, it, it seems, for their rewards. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, Southwest's move is – it's weird a little bit. Like they, they basically published something saying, hey, starting in April, some awards may be more expensive based on route or schedule or because we, you know – Felt like it. Uh, you know, the Ouija board said so. But don't worry, because some of them will still be at the current rates. And what's interesting about that is Southwest is already a revenue-based program, or mostly a revenue-based program. So, you know, you earn based on how much you're spending for the fare times the fare category that you're in. And that's sort of one of the caveats Southwest has, is if you buy a business select fare, you earn more points per dollar, plus you're spending usually more dollars. So there's sort of, you know, there's the multiplier effect in there. Um, similarly, when you redeem... If you have to redeem for business select, it takes more points to make up a dollar's worth of business select fare on redemption. And so when you look at that sort of situation, kind of want to say, huh, well, you guys get to set what the fares are and you get to set what the point values are. Shouldn't like if a route is in high demand, the fares just be higher or maybe you don't have any want to get away fares available. So everybody has to buy uh, what's the next tier up? Uh, Oh, Whatever, it's not business select. Yeah, everything or everything. Yeah, the cheap fare. Um, it's not the super cheap, but it's the next one up. I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, but like, it, it seems a little disingenuous for them to say, well, you know, it's sort of tied to the category of fare you're in, but also there may be some days where we want to get away fares just need to be more expensive. And they've also sort of set it up a terribly untransparent at this point what it's going to mean. Um, is it going to be 10% of flights? Is it going to be 40% of flights? Is it going to be 80% of flights that are like that? How much are they going to be? How much more expensive are they going to be? Is it, you know, they're going to go 10% more expensive or 50% more expensive? Like there's just all these sorts of unclear bits about it and they've done a pretty bad job of publishing additional information. Um, when, obviously when, it's two months away, so maybe we'll get more information there, but. When you want to, when you want to do a fair, you know, purchase a reward fair with, with them now, how is it determined how much you, how many miles you have to give up or points you have to give up? Is it so distance? It's, no, now right now Southwest is revenue based on redemption. So if you are redeeming a want to get away fare, uh, I think it's seventy points per dollar. Okay, so they're saying they're saying the multiplier goes up type thing. That's kind of what they're saying. They just well, so think- what, what, what what they're really saying is like even though it's a want to get away fare, it might be seventy five points per dollar or eighty or a hundred or one hundred and twenty. We don't know what that number is. Yeah. So that they're, they're sort of I think what's really happening is they're decoupling. It, it may just be that they're decoupling the points required from the fare classes mm-hmm. um or maybe it's still gonna be tied to that and there's just gonna be like some flights are more expensive but it's it's weird because they are theoretically tied to revenue and southwest has the all of the controls right if like if it's that much more in demand why aren't fares just ten dollars higher yeah it's almost like they looked at uh, a route. obviously that's because it's almost like they looked at a route and said oh we have these sets of routes where people are always redeeming no matter what the fare is um, but we don't want to raise the fair prices because we want to keep the customers we're getting 
that are paying. And right. so let's just jack up the, the, the mileage redemptions and we'll kill the, the, the mileage redemptions for the, for these, for these fares or try to. Right. And so when, and so when you have a program that's based on no blackout dates, every seat's available for an award, sometimes you have to play that game. Um, what's interesting to me is you and I, uh, sort of had this exchange on Twitter. Um, and this will sort of lead into our next topic as well Is you were like, gosh, looks like they're copying someone based on recent changes in the industry. And my response was, yeah, they copied JetBlue. Yep. When JetBlue released their program, it had this variability in it. And, and, and it actually still charted does, it right? once or twice. Yeah, it still does. It, and, you know, it varies by 20 or 30% what a point might be worth, depending on the fare. And as they get more expensive, points are worth less. And as the fare goes up, it takes more points, to, you know, to get there. And it makes sense. The cheaper fare is more distressed inventory or more likely to be distressed inventory. So you want to unload it any which way you can. Yep. But, um, I don't know, you know, that, that to me is much more what Southwest did, um, than copying Delta. Yeah, and that's uh, kind of is, that's kind of we had some Twitter followers kind of bump in and say, oh, it's Delta, you know, Delta's copying, you know, or they're copying, they're Delta. copying Delta. Yeah, and it's that's not really what was what I was getting at. I I was talking to you because I knew we had had this discussion about JetBlue before, um, but Delta's changes are a little more wide swept and a little more, I would say, non transparent. They're a little more uh, vague. Um, well. I think that both of them are vague. I think deltas are a little more far reaching just because it's a bigger carrier with more partners. And that's really where things get very challenging. But, um, Foz, you were paying a little more attention, I think, than I was to the delta changes. Do you want to dip into that? Yeah, the delta thing, I, I haven't gone back and I mean, I read about it the first day. And basically what it sounds like is they've introduced, aside from variable pricing, so that, you know, they've changed the terms of the program to make it seem like they can change the pricing at a whim. There's no more established, um, award charts. So the only way to get a price is to go through your flight selection. Um, and the other thing that looks to be happening is they're introducing advanced purchase requirements. So, you know, right now, one of the best things, best uses of miles is I've, I want to get the heck out of where I am right now. What can I find for tomorrow? Now there's a penalty for that. So it looked like there is, you know, for, uh, going from a 14 day to zero day would look like it doubled the price. So if we confirm that they're actually doing that, they're actually doubling the price on, um, you know, close in rewards. It's hard to say because they won't publish guidelines. But if you look at any, uh, if you start looking at for awards, people are finding that stuff that's 14, 21 days out is pricing differently uh, than you know stuff seven days out or less. Interesting. And consistently, so a route, you know, short routes that would normally have a lot of availability, or that from a revenue perspective the flights are empty, they're doing the same thing. Hmm. I mean, and, and yep. go ahead, Seth. No, I was gonna say, I mean, like that's that would clearly suck if that's the case. Um, I know when the debate about maybe there's a 21 advanced day, 21 day advance rule. Uh, first started, someone found, you know, a screenshot. I think it was showing LA, JFK, or vice versa, where there were plenty of, you know, low available seats within 21 days. So it wasn't definitely a hard and fast situation. But is that, I mean, when you have five tiers anyways, or even two tiers, is it necessarily that, you know, there's a always seats, you know, based on advanced purchase or anything else? Like, is that necessarily what it's always tied to? I guess, you know, what I'm getting at here is like, Yes, it would suck if all of a sudden Delta put in more strict, uh, an impl- a more strict implementation of a rule like that, but it doesn't seem to me like it's necessarily that new or even uncommon that over time that has been the case. Like, at one point United used to release X, their award, ch- coach award inventory pretty regularly on day of departure and they don't anymore. Um, kind of shitty, but like, is that the end of the world? Is it really a major change to the program or is it just awards are and always have been, you know, the rates have always been somewhat, you know, at the whim of the program. Well, I think that goes with partner awards, though, too. Like, when you're looking for a partner award, you can, like, right now I'm looking for spring break stuff, and it's hard to find anything um, out of out of Portland. So I'm just looking at buying a fare to L.A. or San Francisco because I can find plenty of stuff out of there on partners. But it's only because uh, the partners opened it up on that particular day for that particular number of seats that I'm looking for. And and it, you're still you're, – you're always at the whim of what they're going to open up, right, what their inventory management is telling them to do. The difference here, I guess, is is it available last minute? which is more pressing to people who need to go somewhere tomorrow. I think the more disturbing thing about the Delta changes are it can – now since they don't publish award changes, you can basically do variable pricing at any time of the day. So it's become a revenue. It's just your pay. It's a revenue flight. You're just paying with miles instead of uh, cash. Yeah. Well, and, and that comes to the point that Seth and I were talking about is we don't – we still don't completely understand how partner rewards work with Delta now and, and with – with a maybe like a delta segment thrown in, if you want to go through your example you were talking to me about, Seth. Yeah, so I mean, like we were talking. I think you know, if you're going to fly on Korean uh, to Seoul, 
from LA, which, you know, they have a couple flights a day, usually some inventory on them. Um, but you also need to get to LA as your gateway city. And so, I mean, Stephen, if you were going to do this and fly down from Portland where they have a couple of flights a day, I think. Yep. Right. Okay. We know partner awards are only available at the low level. So in theory, that should be a consistent price from day to day. In theory, if they start variably pricing that as well, that would be a very interesting development. But on top of that, what happens now when you need, you know, a tier two Delta award to get down to the gateway? Is it a one way domestic tier two plus the international? Is it the one way low level plus the difference between low and, you know, tier one and tier two for the domestic segment? And I, that would be way too complicated to do. But, um, you know, th- there's like all these different ways it could theoretically be calculated. And it's not clear which way Delta does it, is going to do it. Um, I know I recently, last October, booked an Air France KLM award. They And it was their tier two for the KLM medal. They wouldn't give me the Delta feeder flight at low on the same award. They wouldn't actually give me the cheaper segment on the same award. So they're killing the award by attrition, right? I mean, that's kind of, if that's, yeah, if that's mean, the way Delta that, goes. And that, was, and that was one where, like, I wasn't even trying to get a higher inventory level. I wanted a lower inventory level, and they wouldn't give it to me on the same ticket. So it was there's a lot of weird things like that and quirks that just each of the different programs has. And that apparently that KLM one, Flying Blue one, has been around forever, um, but or for a long time anyways. But it's very challenging as a consumer to figure out sort of how I'm going to use them and where I can actually get to use them. And especially as you need more and more connections or you you know want to do things that are a little more creative, uh, they make it. It seems sort of exponentially harder as you try to get even a little more creative with them. I agree. I like living in New York City. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, I'm not sure how much we should, how much we can talk about this. I mean, I think it sucks all around. I think there's there's a lot of people calling out Delta on Twitter and in their blogs and stuff to re-release the award charts and why you're not publishing them anymore. And I'm not sure we're ever going to get an answer out of Delta on what their reasoning is behind it. it they clearly have their their reasons and i'm sure we all have our ideas on what those reasons are um uh, but there is something we can talk about and that's a mistake fair on united <laughs> <laughs> it, was a, it was a sale it wasn't a mistake it was a sale <laughs> yes uh clearly I, I, and i think no. we should kind of get in the nitty-gritty of this one because seth you did some research into it and um i think you have some great insight into how fares are sold across borders um so if you just want to go through that real quick and Maybe we can link. Sure. So one, yeah, one of the interesting things, I mean, to be able to file fares across, you know, around the world, it would be a pain in the ass if each airline had to file them in each currency every time. And the airlines all recognized that a long time ago, and so they decided not to do that. And IATA, the their organization, came up with the concept of a neutral unit of conversion or currency or something like that. It's a NUC, NUC. Um, and I always get whatever the C is wrong, but. Um, and the idea is it's actually pegged to the dollar. So in theory, it's you know, NUC is a dollar, but. They also maintain a conversion table, and IATA actually licenses that data out to everybody who wants to use IATA systems. And when you publish a fare, you publish it in NUCs, and then all of the point-of-sale systems or the GDS systems are supposed to price based on converting whatever the NUC number is into the local currency where you're buying based on what the point-of-sale is. Mm -hmm. And so in this case, the, um, the... Sale price appeared to be correct. I mean, when I looked at my fare receipt, it had the right number of NUCs and the correct uh, rate of exchange to Great Britain uh, GBP, British pounds, because it was a ticket originating in London. And then where things get all sorts of wacky is converting from that to Danish kroner or crowns because that's what it was sold in because you were using the Danish version of the website. And United came up and said it was a third-party error, uh, third-party currency conversion like, you know, vendor that they used screwed up, misentered the data. Um, or, you know, I guess it had that conversion rate in, incorrect, I would be what happened there. Yeah, I think so. Um, but it's interesting to me is, you know, for, I guess, a few reasons, they haven't named names on who the vendor is. And it's interesting to me wondering who that might be. I mean, one thing to consider is these fares all showed up on ITA and it showed up there across all airlines, not just United. Yep. One of the, one of the interesting things about it is that the United website actually would sell different currency from point of origin. It was actually, it's you know, sort of a reasonably complex collection of parameters and sort of variances in the system, but the, Del- the United website would sell it and would support that. And it's something that United's been very proud of over the years of being able to have that level of complexity in their system, except, you know, when it comes back and bites them on the ass on like days like today. Now, what's interesting is last Monday, I guess. Well, there was a, there was a, there was a person who posted on flyer talk with, with screenshots of they were buying a, a ticket on British airways in Denmark. 
Right. So, and, and it worked. It gave, they got the same fair price as the United fairs. But it was because right, which, they physically which is why I in there. Think, oh, because they actually live there. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that's what one of the other reasons it makes me think it wasn't you know, just United that, got, that screwed up on this one. It definitely was a third-party vendor. Um, you know, then there's the whole question of the ethics behind all of these things and is it right or wrong and, you know, how many – is it is buying just one okay? Like is that better than buying seven? Does it matter? Yeah. I bet you guys bought some. I bought two. <laughs> one, one actually issued. The other did not. And how quickly were they canceled? By the end of that the night. Day. Yeah, the yeah they, they cancel them out pretty quick. They knew which ones to go after. Um, I I had two, but I had double booked one of them because I realized I didn't need the return segment, so I ended up rebooking it as a one way and was going to cancel the second one, the round trip version. Uh, and then only later in the day did I realize I should have booked it as an open jaw return because I did need to go back to London later in 2015. But a by then it was dead and it became way too confusing to try to get me <laughs> to get that done. I just. You gave up. <laughs> I gave up. Some, some days I can get into this sort of stuff and like spend the hours to tweak and play and make it happen. And some days I just get too frustrated and walk away. Well, I, I, I so I was in the middle of booking one. You guys, I mean, this was like 6 a.m. out here when, when this all started happening. I get, I see this like notes from you guys, like 10 notes from you and Foz about, oh, look at this. And so I started looking at it at 6.15 in the morning and I'm sitting there and I, I have Lufthansa first on the way back to San Francisco. I'm like, oh, this is sweet. I get through all like the, the booking screens and then it gets to the, the last screen where it's like confirming the price and it's like, oh, that availability has gone. And there was nothing left on any partners. It was just the, the United flights. I was like, nah, I don't want to deal with this anymore. I just closed it and went about my day. <laughs> it's like, nah. <laughs> that's how nice. bad I am. That's how, that's how $100, you know, that's how much I care about $100. <laughs> well, A, I have to say I commend Seth for not wanting to do throwaway ticketing on this. That's a pretty impressive, uh, you know, justification right there. <laughs> hey, I'm trying to play by the rules. <laughs> Ish. It was a it was a fully flexible fare. You just changed the return. <laughs> well, in, in my case, actually, it was weird. It priced the return as an L ticket in coach. Weird. What? Yeah, I don't know. I I'm telling you, I well, I had the email somewhere. I'm sure with the confirmation number, but it was a bizarre ticket. Well, the other thing I heard is in the midst of this, Lufty started blocking uh, zeroing out all their F buckets. <laughs> so because I wouldn't. I guess they figured something was going on, and so they jumped on it. Yeah. Well, well now, actually, I wonder how the because right for the ATI, everything originating in the U.S. United controls, right? Not the inventory, just the fares. Okay. So the you inv- think you think they saw their inventory being eaten up and were trying to figure out what's going on and looked at the tickets? <laughs> well, let's think about this. If you're sitting in Frankfurt and you suddenly see all your first class seats for the next eleven months getting sold, what are you going to think? <laughs> now, see, if people had waited like five more hours, it would have been nighttime in Germany. And they could have just had a field day with this thing. <laughs> I, in hindsight, I wish I could have just been a little – like if I was in London, it would be awesome because I would have tried to fly that day. And what are they, <laughs> once your ticket's open, what are they going to do? They're not going to cancel the ticket once it's already flown. They might put you back in the coach, but you know you could fight it at that point. But there's a monk that would, would – there was a monk flying back from Africa that would you know disagree with you. <laughs> didn't, didn't we talk about that on the show? Yeah, we did. We did. <laughs> uh yeah, I mean, yeah, so maybe the return half of your ticket, but we think it was fraud, so we're just going to not let you fly. Sorry. <laughs> and in that case, if I was in London, I'd be coming home. So if I get stuck at home, big deal. Yeah, like, ah, too bad. Uh, so I, the DOT is clearly going to be involved in this. Um, chances of this being revived, these tickets being revived? Uh, my feeling is that if they had – if they, you know, there's theories all, all over the internet in that if you're flying – because there's someone that some of the routes people are buying didn't include the U.S. at all. Okay. So people are buying like London Frankfurt to Cape Town or Joburg. I, I think those are those are dead no matter what because the DOT is not going to touch them. The ones I, I imagine that United has consulted with the DOT before making that decision. In the end, it may be one of these. Well, we'll let you fly this and coach, uh, or you won't get the miles, or you know, it'll be some sort of uh, consolation. But I mean, the rules currently say that they have to honor them. Because in a lot of these cases, the tickets were indeed issued. Yeah, the the only caveat there, and this is the part where I'm, I haven't seen it in writing necessarily, but I've seen enough sort of talk about it, sort of the meta conversation about the rules, is that the DOT has indicated some willingness to uh, be flexible towards the airline's favor if there is evidence of manipulation or acting in bad faith. And so, in a recent um, NPRM, the Notice for Proposed Rulemaking, sort of what the DOT has to do to change its rules. Uh, the note, sort of the intro said, 
we've been seeing a lot of behavior and they actually call out um, online travel blogs and forums for people who are finding these things and exploiting them uh, as suggesting that. And the way the document is written, it doesn't say, and that's enough to say we won't honor it or you don't have to honor it or we won't enforce the rules, but they are seeking input on how those sorts of things should be handled. So that's sort of the first indication that's been published and that came out middle of last year. So it's been out a little while now uh, indication from the DOT that it is willing to consider that maybe a absolute blanket all fares must be honored rule is a little too, uh, too much, you know, the pendulum swung too far the other way. It's too, too much in favor of the consumer, but I don't know. But historically, United has been pretty good at honoring mistake fares. I mean, they had those Korean, the Seoul fares last year, which are, you know, missing a zero. Um, sure. And they honored all of them. But, you know, some of the reservations did get notated that you're not allowed to change them, uh, but they did honor them. I, yeah. And, you know, you know, that's the, here's the thing that, like, at one level, this sort of goes back to my question, like, is buying one too many? Is buying seven too many? Where do you draw the line? Is United making the decision based on what it can get away with or what the financial impact to itself directly is? Like, oh, we're only going to lose a million dollars. Okay, we'll honor it. Oh, we're going to lose 10 million. Never mind. Is that their approach? Is it they they didn't want to honor it anyways, but they thought the DOT wouldn't let them get away with it, so they had to? Well, I think the other thing is who becomes responsible for eating it? You know, there's a lot of transatlantic stuff, so that would be the ATI. So all the carriers would take that in theory. So how do Lufthansa, Swiss, Brussels, Air Candle respond to that? Well, and, and we know what Swiss has done previously. I mean, they took the thing to court during those Rangoon fairs um, yep. and won. Yeah, that was in Canada. Yeah, and and they won. So, yeah. uh, I mean, I, I just – what was amazing to me about this fair was how much it spread like wildfire. I mean, it was – people I had, people were posting about this on Twitter bragging about, well, look at this $100 fare I got you know, from London to you know San Francisco in first class for $100. It was in mainstream media. It was covered on NPR. It was covered on all the major networks. I mean, was it, it, it is went, this week that had their UK office published a story about it and it included the aside, like halfway down the story? And yes, we all stopped working for forty five minutes while we tried to buy tickets. Yeah, it was. <laughs> like, I mean, and let's be fair, I stopped working for forty five minutes also, but I, I wasn't. It was still early in the morning, and I wasn't, you know, doing a job. So, I mean, I think part of it has become just that mistake fares and all of these things. Whether you know, regardless of where they sort of get shared, are being shared more broadly, and yeah. so it was easier to honor it when it was a hundred people than it was a thousand. Yep. And United said thousand used the word thousands of people bought tickets. So we obviously we don't know the number, but um, it's a big number. <laughs> uh, Seth, I think you bought uh, tickets on the American Airlines seven eighty seven inaugural. Did you not? I did. I did. I uh, just got my seat assignment. 28L. It's the last window seat of the set of three. Nice. Very excited for that. Very yeah. nice. Um, uh, and when's this going to happen? Uh, May 7th. Okay. Uh, from Dallas to Chicago. Uh, interestingly, they've copied United's plan of going from Texas to Chicago uh, for inaugurals <laughs> with the new 787s. Uh, that makes sense just from uh, where the crews are based and such. But um, yeah, I've got a, uh, I've got my seat. It was, uh, it was interesting. American announced that they were going to put it on sale on Saturday. And then by like very late in the day on Saturday, still hadn't really updated their systems. And I had a bizarre Twitter exchange with them early in the day. U.S. Airways was showing it, but American wasn't. Was showing the flight as a 787. Um, and it ended up being that flight. And early in the day, I asked them like, oh, we don't know. We're still updating our systems. Later in the day, I got it after they had actually updated it and showed it as a 787, but didn't have the seat map updated. Uh, I got an, I, you know, posted a screenshot of that on Twitter and their team wrote back to me and like, uh, you should check your data. That's definitely going to be an A320. Please refresh your search. And I, I was trying to be nice, but I wrote back what was probably a more inappropriate than not uh, message. Like, why don't you guys go check your PR materials? You announced that this was going on sale today and you haven't actually managed to pull it off yet. And then someone else saw that and got mad at me for being like, for, you know, it's like, gosh, I can't believe the American Airlines Twitter team has to put it up with such jerks like Seth. And I'm like, you know, I've been trying to buy a ticket here, and you guys, they can't give me information, and like they keep giving me conflicting information. They're part of like the public face of the company. They've got to do that a little better. So let me get this right. In this case, shares was more accurate than Saber? That's correct. Do not post that on Flyer Talk. You will be, <laughs> you're a heathen if you post it on Flyer Talk. Sorry, that was just... No, I didn't even consider that aspect of it, but that was, that was a very well-placed, very well-placed <laughs> jab. 
Um, <laughs> we may have to try to work that into the show title this this episode. Uh, um, so, <laughs> you know, we actually talked to we talked to Rolo a little bit about this about the 787 um, offline. He's actually in Argentina, I believe, right now. Um, and we Shot. said, hey, it's going to be one of the first uh, routes is DFW uh, Buenos Aires, and he he kind of quipped, oh, no first class, you know, uh, which I thought was funny. <laughs> but what's funny to me is that there's only 28. Uh, business class seats on the on the plane. It's 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 like eight less than United, right? Yep. Um, fewer, but yeah. Yeah, there's eight fewer. Sorry, Seth. Pet peeve. Sorry. You're, you're, you're <laughs> uh, we got the AP style book here. Um, no, I'm just playing. Um, so I mean, it is a lot fewer uh, premium cabin seats, um, which is interesting. And, and yeah, eight fewer premium, and it's uh, they're at a hundred and ninety eight. Coach seats, I think, 48 in main cabin extra and 150 in regular coach, main cabin. So it's going uh, to be tight in the back then. Yeah, and United is 70 and 110 or something like that, 73 and 110s roughly. Yep, so you're talking about a whole extra row 13. almost. Of... Yeah, it's like 20 extra economy seats and 8 fewer business seats. Yep. So uh, least... it'll be interesting. I mean, it's the, it's the new American custom seat, so it's the, the herringbone front rear facing layout. Uh, something I didn't notice about it until someone showed it to me the other day is that the way the footwell is designed on the American one, um, you know, is, is no different than a lot of the other footwells out there. But it's so, it's a relatively confined uh, place for your feet to go into. It's not covered necessarily like you know the United footwells on their uh, we call it the Continental seats. Yeah. But it's a uh, it's an interesting layout there that some taller passengers have complained about. Yeah, because it's pretty tight. I mean, it comes to kind of like a point. Uh, where your feet have to kind of shove into a much smaller space. So I'd be, I'm looking forward to your trip report. I have to wait till May, but you know. Yeah. Well, it's, I love this sort of thing. I'm just reading on Flyer Talk. I've been following along and on Twitter following along. The number of people who you know, I know who are going to be on the flight is significant. So I'm always entertained by that sort of event. Yeah, yeah. That'll be, that'll be fun. Hopefully we don't cause too much trouble. <laughs> um, I think the last, so, oh, go ahead. So, I was just going to say, so, you know, you made, it's 28 seats. It actually matches the number of seats on this. Six threes, two of them are always blocked. Oh. It matches the 767s that United has? No, no, no. The ones that American has. Oh. They're just, they're just staying in line with their, with the, the same number of seats. Interesting. Because they have 30 seats on their 763s, but two of them are, every flight I've ever been on, the two of the seats are always blocked. Is that a crew rest thing? One is kind of a crew rest, and the other they always use for staging. Staging, what? yeah, like the the flight attendants always use it for. It's the right side bulkhead when uh, bulkhead seats. Interesting. I wonder if it is blocked as crew rest, and it's like the United deal where they have to have direct aisle access. So that second seat, the, the flight attendants just sort of borrow it from the pilots. Right. It's very possible that that's what that's what's actually going on. So I, I'd be interested to know. There are they going to have the crew rest uh, up above on their on their seven eighty sevens. I have to assume so. I haven't seen it one way or the other. That was part of my plan to get in to see at some point on the American plane. Um, hopefully, I'll find out soon. Because Aero Mexico, right? They they do not have the up, upstairs. That's what you had told Correct. us before. Yeah, yeah. Aero Mexico uses a couple rows down in the back uh, as regular seats as their crew rest. They do not have bunks, but they're the only carrier I know who has gone that route. So interesting. Um, I think the last topic uh, is the BA. BA um, Avios changes. I don't think we really talked about that much, but I mean, they kind of got a real kick in the butt. So yeah, that, that's uh, it's there's a couple different things that happened. One is they instituted uh, peak versus off peak. So if you're flying on BA metal on short haul flights, uh, about two thirds of the year, I think it's roughly 200 days, 220 days, something like that, uh, you can get off peak rewards. So they're actually a little cheaper for sort of the Europe flights from London, but. Now you used to get you used to get your London your your UK connections for free. So if you had to hop up to Manchester or something like that, uh, that extra segment was free. That's no longer going to be the case. Uh, they also are now making uh, first class as a four x price instead of three x on coach. Uh, so it used to be you know coach was you know one x and then it was one and a half x for premium economy, two x for business, three x for first. Now it's just going to be one two three four, uh, which I'd say actually that's the most surprising to me that that didn't happen sooner. But uh, whatever. Uh, and also uh, upgrades get more expensive because upgrades are based on the difference in the award chart. So if you're upgrading from coach to business, you're now paying 1x to 3x instead of 1x to 2x. And they, uh, the numbers, I think, of category four or band, you know, distance band four and higher 
uh, get nasty in a hurry. Interesting. So is there so. is there is there some benefits to the Avios program anymore, or um, is it, are we kind of losing the value that we used to have there with short haul flights and stuff? So for short haul coach, it hasn't changed. Okay. Uh, not enough to matter, anyways, right? If your if your goal is to get live in the United States, get a BA Chase card, and churn Avios that way, and use them for short hops on American and U.S. Airways and coach, or I guess it's really just American, um, whatever. Um, you're still going to do okay for now. I don't think you've got, I don't think it's actually gotten any better for you, um, which someone claimed the other day, uh, that the points are more valuable now because, you know, there's going to be fewer of them out there because the earn rates went down on, for people flying. So smart consumers who just book through credit cards are going to get better value. Uh, I think that's bullshit, but, um, <laughs> such is life. Uh, I'm also not trying to sell credit cards. Um, no, I think that, there is definitely still value in the program from that perspective. If you are someone who flies on coach American Airlines flights using your Avios, you know, domestically, you're going to do okay. But for people who like the, there used to be a great upgrade sweet spot on premium economy to club world between the U S and, uh, UK. And that's gone away. Yeah. Or it's, it's just gotten twice as expensive. Um, it's, uh, there's some pain points there. Interesting. I have to, I have to read more about it cause I'm so, like I know you guys always tell me like Avios, you guys, you know, oh Stephen, you got to use Avios, and it's it's always been one of those I'm kind of I'm leery to use, but well, I, especially because you've got so many Alaska air flights, you can exactly. So maybe I, I should look well, at it. What I will tell you is I'm still living off the same Avios from BMI. <laughs> so, <am I. laughs> so take what we say with the grain of salt. It is a great value, but clearly you see us not uh, piling on more points in that program. Yeah, I mean, because well, I was looking. But at, that's because I already have them. And it's, right. I, you know, I use them where I can. I use them judiciously, but, like, I also don't take a lot of short domestic flights. I completely agree with you, and that's the same thing. Like, it's been great when I need to go to Canada. That's probably the best redemption of them because um, yeah. Canadian flights are expensive. But, it, you know, I don't find myself using a lot of short-haul flights, and in, um, I don't know how you would use that up in the Pacific Northwest because American and U.S. Air don't really have short flights out of Portland. Alaska. Can you redeem Alaska, Avios for Alaska? I don't think you can. Sure you can. If we can, then I I would like to redeem some because flights to L.A. on the dates I need are insane. <laughs> are we looking it up right now? I am. Looking I'm gonna look it up again. I have them in all my award charts, and people love them. Yeah, absolutely. Because I've never seen Alaska flights show up, so it may be one that you have to call. Oh, it's in. not online. You may have to call. Which is a painful process. Sure. I actually was calling to try to get seat assignments for my flight home from Istanbul. I'm flying on BA, and I don't. I guess I'm gonna have to pay for them if I wanted them. But I was just calling to see what was available, and. uh I couldn't even get through. I just got a busy signal, <laughs> which, as I understand, is actually reasonably common calling the U.S. call center. So, yay. Wow. wow. Well, I think that's the show, guys. Uh, Foz, you want to tell everybody where to find you? Twitter at FozM or occasionally on upgrd.com slash Foz. Okay. Seth? I'm uh, Seth, also known as The Wandering Airman. I'm at uh, wandr.me or just wandr.me on Twitter or Instagram. And I'm Stephen Seagraves. You can find me on Twitter at scgraves, or um, I blog sometimes at badice.com. Uh, you can follow Dots, Lines, and Destinations uh, at Dots, Lines on Twitter, or more dots, more lines.com. Leave us a comment. Uh, we're also on Facebook, I think. So I think it's Dot Lines there, too. So, uh, yeah, I'd like to hear from you. Thanks for listening. Uh, Seth, have a good trip. Uh, Foz, we'll talk to you later. Indeed. Thank yeah. you. Take care. Bye, guys.